And I will remember that 3-3 three, three comment. How many times have you heard a, a, an MC use the word singular in their presentation? Pretty cool, right? What a vocabulary this guy has. <laughs> So listen, far too quiet in here. Come on, gear, gear fast, right? All right, that's more like it. That is more like it. So we're going to have some fun today. We're going to do some, uh, some chatting with these two guys. We're going to, well, let me get my notes back up. We're going to uh, hear some incredible music. So you're going to get to, uh, to hear songs that these guys wrote that you may not know that they wrote that have been incredible hits, and they're going to be jamming with Jordan and Matt. It's going to be, uh, we're going to have a fun hour here. And so I'm going to give you just a little bit of background on them. I could spend the whole time talking about them, but I'm just going to give you a little sketch here. So Jeff Skunk Baxter is our, our first victim here today, founding member of Steely Dan, Doobie Brothers, member of Spirit. You may not know he was actually the bassist for Jimi Hendrix for a while in Jimmy James and the Blue Flames. I don't know if everybody knew that. But sessions include Brian Adams, Joni Mitchell, Ringo Starr, Rod Stewart, Donna Summers, literally countless more. Uh, Al, uh, whoops. What happened here? There we go. Producer for Nazareth, Carl Wilson, The Ventures, Nils Lofgren, Bob Welch. He's composed music for television, for shows like King of the Hill, Pee Wee's Playhouse, Beverly Hills 90210, and more. Music for film, Roxanne, Blues Brothers. He's also basically in charge of the, Uni the United States defense system, so he's, <laughs> he's, he's the man behind that as well. And we appreciate that, Jeff. Danny Korchmar, The Bee Gees, The Flying Machine, The Fugs, The City with Carol King, The Section. Some of his session credits include Linda Ronstadt, David Crosby, David Cassidy, Graham Nash, Neil Young, Carly Simon, countless more. Major albums, of course, with Carole King and James Taylor. He's written and co-written songs with Jackson Brown, Don Henley, and an endless list of many others. Uh, solo albums, including Cooch and Innuendo. Composed music for Cheech and Chong's Up in Smoke, which I didn't know. That's very cool. Very cool. Right on. Produced recordings for Don Henley, Neil Young, John Bon Jovi, Stevie Nicks, Billy Joel, Hanson, Tracy Chapman, and more. And he's currently with the Immediate Family Band, which is Waddy Wachtel, Leland Sklar, Russ Kunkel, and uh, Steve Fostel, doing all those great, hit, great hits that these guys have been involved in. So let's welcome them to the stage. They're going to play some music for us. <laughs> Jeff and Danny, come on up, guys. <clears throat> So we'll chat for a second here before we start playing. So one of the, uh, the amazing things, and we were talking about this a little before we came up here, is that uh, there really has been, and especially during the kind of golden age of the LA session scene and New York session scene, there was like a core group of players that really did a lot of the work and that create a lot of the music that we hear coming out of those major studios. And you guys were part of that scene, a part of, part of doing all those sessions. Tell us a little bit about that time and how, how one became one of those uh, movers and shakers in the session business. Well, uh, you're exactly right. There was a group, a core group of, of guys that uh, played on practically everything. Uh, in L.A., the first group of people that got any attention was uh, the Wrecking Crew. And uh, unfortunately, for the, for the great Wrecking Crew, and this is all the best musicians in L.A. were in that, in that organization, but this is before credits were being um, put on albums. So nobody knew who they were. They were playing on everything, but they weren't listed as uh, on the albums. The, the, first, the first couple of albums I played on uh, was uh, Lou Adler producing and, and um, Peter Escher producing, and they put our names on there, mine and Russ's and Lee's. So we were known. We, we got to be well-known very quickly by virtue of having our names on those albums, on those kind of well-known well albums. So we got a lot of credit for that, and, and you know, uh, we owe a great deal to Peter Escher and, and Lou Adler for that. All of us do. So that kind of started the idea of people recognizing who played on record. Isn't that right, Jeff? Something well, like that. The thing I liked about being a studio guy, studio slut, session slut. <laughs> you know, I'm a sensitive artist, man. Where's the check? <laughs> um, but uh, it, it meant that you were kind of reached a, an area where you, you were respected by your peers. And uh, doing session work was great. And it's good for your health, by the way, because... Uh, if you're in a rock and roll band, famous guy, you've got people around you who are always telling you how great you are, even if you're doing stupid stuff. But you show up in the studio, 
9 o'clock downbeat, if you screw up, they've got 2,000 people waiting for that chair that you're sitting in. And so you've got to get it right first time. And uh, there's something about that that I like. I also like the, uh, the idea of being a part of the, sort of the whole music scene. I remember uh, uh, Gary Katz, who produced uh, Steely Dan, called me. He was doing a, a project with a young singer lady. He said, I need you to come in, bring all your stuff. I'm paying you a triple scale. I need you to come and listen to this and put all the stuff in it that it needs to have. And I listened to the record, and I said, Gary, you don't need anything. It's fine. And he said, that's why I pay you a triple scale. <laughs> because what they were looking for is they're looking for your judgment. I mean, Dan, Dan walks into the studio. What they want from him is not just great guitar playing. They want musical input. They want creative input. That's exactly and it's great to be you know, a part of that, part of that crew. Yeah, you're exactly, you're exactly right. That is the case. <coughs> and um, the thing about playing, doing sessions is you have to make every, everyone else sound good. In other words, your job is not to play solos or to sit around and wait till your solo comes. As a guitar player, your job is to make the drummer sound good, especially the singer, the producer. You're supposed to play for them, not for yourself. So I don't know if any of you guitar players are out there going home and going, <laughs> got news for you. Nobody's going to pay you for that. <laughs> They're going to pay you to make other people sound good. They're going to pay you to back up a singer and thrill that, that singer. And they're going to pay you to make the producer very happy by playing hooks and making their records better. So I'd say keep that in mind, all you guitar players that are out there. Um, anyway, that's my comment well, it's about like, it. It's like being a gunslinger. I mean, I remember I did a million jingles. I used to sleep on the couch in Universal in Chicago, go on Sunday night, sleep on the couch, do seven, eight jingles a day, go home on Fridays. You know? And uh, one day... We're, it's myself and a bunch of very fine studio musicians, C.J. Vanson, a bunch of guys. And uh, uh, Bobby W., I won't go into the actual guy's name, he comes in totally gacked, three days up, you know, his hair's all over the place. He says, all right, guys, you ready to go? I said, what are we doing? He says, Hyatt, 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 Hyatt Hotels. Okay, uh, you got the music? Yeah. So he hands out sheet music. It's got a key signature, a title, and 64 empty bars. Right. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, and he says, you guys ready? And, uh, yeah, all right, give us a click, count it off, you know. Yeah. You, just, you just never know. Uh -huh. you know? That's right. Well, as, as session cats, you know, you're supposed to, most of us are producers. We're called upon to produce. A lot of times in L.A., the producer would call all of us, and his job is done because he's called all these great accompanists and all these great cats, and everyone thinks like a producer. Isn't that right, Jeff? You've got to think like a producer to be a good session cat. And uh, we all were taught to do that, to think like producers. So that's a very important part of um, doing, doing dates, I would say. Well, yeah, you got to, you're right. The guy, the guy comes in, you're doing a soul beer commercial or something like that, says, you know, I'm not getting enough foam. <laughs> oh, yeah, hold on. <laughs> got you right here, no problem. Dial in a little foam, what do you think? <laughs> oh, yeah, great, thanks, man. That's right, yeah, <laughs> perfect. It's, it's, it gets weird. <laughs> yeah, it does get weird, you're right about that. Lee, Lee Sklar has a switch on his bass that he calls the producer switch. Because the producer comes and say, you know, Lee, it sounds great. So anything you can do just with your sound, we just to tweak it a little bit. He goes, well, oh, check this. Flip that switch. But, oh, that's so much better. Great. The switch did nothing. Hey, perception is everything. That's awesome. And confidence. I mean, that's the one thing. I mean, studio guys are a lot like fighter pilots. And my other job, I spent a lot of time with fighter pilots. But you got to have a lot of confidence. And, you, and sometimes the producer you got to help him, and Danny's right about that, that you have to support him in the way that makes him look good, and, you know, he may not really understand what he's doing uh, a couple of times, but, you know, you make him look good. That's More that's than what a you couple do. of times. We're like a makeup artist for music. <laughs> I dig it. <laughs> right, right. So you mentioned confidence. You mentioned thinking like a producer. Are there other characteristics that go into being a great session musician? I would say keep your mouth shut. Listen, pay attention. It's not about you, it's about who you're working for and who you're supposed to be out there making look good. You're playing for the band, you're playing for the singer, and you're playing for the producer. You ain't playing for yourself. You want to play for yourself, go home and do that. You know, if you're called to do a date, you show up on time, keep your mouth shut, and find something to play that's going to help the situation. Yeah, and kind of, you know, you got to keep your wits about you. I remember my first session, Tommy Tedesco saved my butt. You know, he said he was the one that made a mistake. Well, we all learned, like, okay, so you're going to, um, okay, we're going to do a Frito-Lay commercial, right? So we want that Spanish thing. The guy, of course, writes out all this stuff, and you go, yeah, right. So, okay. 
He goes, oh, that's great. Okay, so you play that. So the next session, we're doing Soul Beer. Okay. You know, it's just you got to kind of be able to think on your feet. No matter what they write, you got to, you know, you got to kind of interpret it for them. That's right. That's, cool. <laughs> that's, that's, all, that's awesome. So you, you mentioned the, uh, you know, the, the reputation that, that uh, uh, precedes studio musicians is that they're able to read anything. And that the reading is a critical skill to be able to read all the, all the black dots on the page. Is that a critical part? That's of called that? fly shit. Yeah. Right. I didn't yeah. want to say it, but you were going to say it. Well, in some, for some gigs, yeah, you have to be able to read, especially commercials, jingles, uh, movie scores. For pop records, uh, the ones I did anyway, and this is back in the uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you had to, um, they'd give you a, a rhythm chart. That's it, just the chords. You're supposed to come up with a part, and it's supposed to be terrific, that part. It's supposed to be great, and that's what you're being paid for. So you're really, um, you listen and you come up with something that's going to, uh, you know, it's going to help the situation right away. Usually it's just chord change, chord charts, you know. Okay. Isn't that right? No, it's true. I, uh, you know, not to toot the horn, but J.D. Sally was doing a record, and I guess they were trying to get a guitar part, you know, and so I got a call from somebody who woke me up too in the morning. That sounds right. Yeah. What's up? Uh, I need you to do a guitar part. Okay, so you load up and you go in, you walk in, you're, you're, you're still like all the crap in your eyes, and you plug in. Thank you. And they go, that's great. Thank you. Go home. I mean, the reading is important, but Cooch is right. There's this innate sense that I guess you get, a musical sense that you get after you make enough records and you play with enough musicians, that people look for you, look to you for musical parts, taste, right. for the right, the right edition. That's right. That's been my experience, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. yeah okay. I've waited long enough. How about you guys? You want to hear some music? Yeah. All right. Let's have a song from these guys. All right. Let's see here. Uh, first of all, guys, can you turn my voice up in the monitors here? These here? There you go. Hey, there he is. There you go. Louder if you can. And yeah, always louder. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all for it. Oh, yeah. So here's a tune, uh, I wrote this tune for James Taylor a long time ago, and um, we do it obviously different. James is just kind of folky, but we're going to play it a different way. This is Machine Gun Kelly. Come on, come on. 
machine gun They came and took that boy away They stuck him in a hole in Leavenworth prison, yeah Just lived there till his dying day Watch out, machine gun And don't let her run around Don't let a woman take you out to be a clown Machine gun Awesome, right? By the way, there's hot women, there's cool women, there's beautiful women, and then there's Jordan. <laughs> Jordan West. <laughs> awesome player. With a new album, by the way. You right? killed Not it long ago, re Recorded here at Sweetwater? Oh, I did. Yeah, yeah. And this is Matt Schuler on bass from Roland as well. I was going to wait to another spot. I'm sorry, right. I apologize. I didn't mean to steal the... Uh, but he, but he plays in my band, so I just didn't want to wait and not recognize him. So it's our own session musicians here on stage. Right on, right on. So tell us a little bit about going into a session, and you've talked about how you're kind of on the spot to come up with parts, and I can only imagine that part of being able to do that is having a good depth of knowledge about all the different styles and, and uh, types of music and different, uh, you know, different contexts that you're going to be working in. Tell us a little bit about how you develop that and how important that is to what you do. Well, you want to listen to everything, you know. There's no, somebody once said, there's no bad music, there's only bad musicians. And uh, that's pretty much true. You listen to all kinds of music, you know. Anyone that tells you, I hate a whole genre of music is not paying attention. There's good stuff in every genre, so, you know, the idea, well, I hate reggae, I hate disco. There's some good, good disco records, you know. And there's nothing but great reggae records, so that's bullshit, you know. <laughs> don't ever, you know, don't ever cop that attitude, you know. And I've heard, run into music, it's like, I hate blues. I can't stand blues. Yeah, and you can't play blues, which means you suck. <laughs> and um, so that's something to keep in mind, you know. Listen, keep your ears open. Pay attention. No, no, right, Jeffrey. What do you think? Absolutely. I mean, I like that, that you suck. Yeah, if you think you're a musician, you're not if you can't play everything. Or at least have enough caring and enough interest in it. I mean, I grew up in Mexico City. You talk about a strange, diverse background, everything from German umpa music to, you know, La Sonora Santanera, you know, everything was... And the good news is, if you, if you open your heart and if you open your mind, when you're that, at that one session where they're really looking for something and they're, hard, they're having a hard time finding it, it's something that you heard when you were 11 years old that you weren't particularly interested, but you opened your ears and you opened your head and you stored it and it's there for you to, to, to uh, look back on again when you're, when you're in a tough situation. I mean, I studied classical piano. People say, ah, oh, classical piano. Really? Man, if Beethoven had been a pedal steel player, my God, it would have been unbelievable because of the way the guy writes. So the things that you, if, if you are willing to listen and willing to understand and willing to, you know, sit there for a second. I mean, I'm not a big light opera guy, but I'll, you got to check it out. Because right. some talented guy wrote a great light opera. That's right. So you got to know it. I don't want to suck, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so the other part of the equate well not another part of the equation I should say is that you need to find the right tone to fit into as a guitar player to fit into what's happening and make sure you're in context with what's uh, particularly when you're working for an, for another artist talk a little bit about guitar tone how important having your own tone is as a session musician and how important it is to be to be flexible I guess with that well again it depends on who you're playing with but uh, generally speaking listen to the drummer and get your original sound based on what the drummer's doing. And also, definitely, if there's another guitar player on, on the date, and it usually is, listen to what he's doing and don't do that. Do something else. Wherever he's, if he's down low, get high. If he's playing busy, you play simple. Whatever he's doing, do something else. That's how you get that blend, and that's how you get the kind of orchestrational quality uh, from... Uh, well, yeah, but don't get too high. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Speak right, for yourself. I'm just, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, right. <laughs> So, <clears throat> but he's right. And one of the reasons why I truly love Cooch is because there's a lot of great guitar players, but there's not a lot of guitar players that listen. And he's right. The number one attribute for a studio musician is to listen to your other people, or any musician for that matter. And if two guitar players get together and listen to each other, man, it's like it's unstoppable. The, the sum is greater than the parts. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's... it's I hate to say it's rare because that's, that's being mean, but Jesus, man, the one thing, how many guitar players out there, you know? How many guitar players actually listen to the folks that they play? Ho, oh, whoa. Well, okay, being honest is good. Now today you're going to change your ways and everything's going to, you know, you're going to be fine. Um, but uh, uh, he's absolutely right. Listen to other players and also uh, don't play. I mean, that's really the lesson. They're paying you for what you don't play. They're, they're not paying you to fill up holes. They're paying you to just find the one spot. It's like, uh, I mean, Dizzy Gillespie is probably the greatest bebop trumpet player ever lived. So when Miles Davis came on the scene, he said, you know, I'm never gonna I don't, I'm never going to have the chops that Dizzy has. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick every note. I'm going to find the right note for the right spot at the right time. And sometimes there is no note. And that can be as powerful as, as playing something. Yeah. Miles, so, used to, Miles used to say, it's what's in between the notes. That's right. That's significant. That's right. And I think that's the same thing you're saying. In, uh, in, in Latin music, they call it the clave. Mm -hmm. It's that space that your mind fills in. <clears throat> and that's the other kind of thing that's hard for people to kind of understand. You're playing music for other people. Give them a chance. Give them a chance to get into it. Yeah, I mean, let them in. Let them in. Yeah, let exactly them in. Right. Find spaces for them. Open up places. The really good hit records are the places that are, like, we call them snare drum songs, where the only thing that you hear in one particular spot is just the snare mm -hmm. or just one other thing that opens it up for, for the listener to participate. Because if you turn people off, I mean, what the hell, you know? Right. Stupid. Right. A lot of people wonder, for instance, how did they get that Led Zeppelin drum sound? It's awesome. One of the ways they get it is everyone is not pounding away all the time. Yeah. So you can hear them put space in the music, and that's when that snare drum pops out and comes through. Uh, you wonder why well, the snare drum isn't coming out. It's because everybody's pounding away in the same register. You've got to get out of the way, and then you'll hear that snare drum, and you'll hear everybody else. You know, uh, you know that's a, and that's a good point. When you talk about tone and equalization, mm -hmm. remember the human beings, the, the peak of the fletcher munson curve when you listen is at uh, 1,000 cycles is 1K. That's where the human voice is. When you equalize your guitar, when you use whatever it is to get your tone, put a big scoop in the middle of it. Just dump it all at 1K mm -hmm. because two things will happen. Number one, the vocalist will be able to hurt, be heard on the record, and you'll be able to be heard right. because you'll be playing in a, in a particular area of the frequency mm -hmm. spectrum that nobody else is using. And if there's three or four guitar players, Put your guitar out of phase. That's an old studio trick. Yep. It'll come through the recording no matter what. These things that you learn, but you're right about the tone. It's, it's not only your tone, because everybody, each person, if Danny played this guitar, it would sound completely different. I mean, it'd be close, but it would be completely different. That's it's right. the attack. It's the way you approach it. It's the way you touch. A lot of that has to do with your tone. Right. I mean, hell, I did that first Donna Summer record. I bought a guitar for 25 bucks. It was a... Burns Bison Jr. Tone? I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, you just plug it in, open the six-pack, and, you know, go. <laughs> right. You know, it's, it's, your tone really comes a lot from your own uh, attack. It comes from your, you, also from your heart and from your hands. That's true. That's where your tone really comes from, you know, about that, Jeff. You know, I realized that when I started playing, 
Uh, I, was, I couldn't get a sound. Was, well, my sounds are terrible and terrible. And then finally, I tried every different guitar and every different amp. And then I started to get a sound. It just took time. And then when I got it, started to get a sound, it didn't matter what, play, what I played. It didn't matter what guitar, what amp. That's right. I was getting my sound and finding my, my place. Yeah. So keep, you've got to keep playing, keep listening. And uh, eventually, you'll, you'll, you'll find your place, I think. Yeah, that's the one great bullshit line that I hear. You know, you're, you're, you're going to go play with a bunch of guys, and guitar player says, oh, man, you know, I don't have this uh, XL7949D pedal, mm -hmm. and it's not my guitar, and it's this amp. I can't get my sound. Uh -huh. So really? Really? Yeah, I know, right. Is that your problem? Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, you got a bigger problem than that, pal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And don't, also, don't expect the engineer to get your sound. You walk into the studio with your sound. You bring that sound with you. The engineer ain't going to save your ass. You're going to save your ass by coming, walking into the studio with a good sound and an appropriate sound, uh, yeah. I would say. Can you, uh, is, is part of that bringing in your own effects and delivering a finished sound, or do they add the effects and things afterward in the production? Uh, it, depends on, it depends on the situation. Uh, a lot of times we prefer to put, for instance, delay. Sometimes you'll leave that. But if it's part of the song and if it's helping the band, yeah, kick that thing in, you know. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if it's, um, you know, that it might be a mixing uh, issue rather than what you're going to play live. You okay. can just use your right to think, you know. Sure. Well, it's also about the toolkit. I mean, if you're building a house and you're going to put up two by four, you bring a hammer. That's what you do. You hammer nails. Now, if you're going to build the rest of the house, there's a whole other set of tools that you need to bring with you to finish the house. So a lot of it has to do with what the session is going to be. I mean, a, a lot of times uh, I'll, I'll, when I do a session, I'll, I'll bring like 25 guitars. I, I, you know, it sounds like a lot, but you don't know what they're going to ask for. Oh, I want a Nashville high strung in G. Uh, uh, okay, well, we got one of those. Or you, you have to bring the appropriate tools. So your sound and the tools that you bring with you kind of vary. Um, I mean, a lot of people bring, you know, a fair amount of stuff with them. They're their stuff, but uh, if you don't have the right tool, then you either have to bullshit your way through the session, which we do a lot, or, or um, just make sure that you, that you have the appropriate tools. That's why you come to a place like this, walls and walls of cool pedals. I mean, my buddy Yoshi makes really cool pedals. He's, ladies and gentlemen, the president of Boss, Yoshi Ikigami. <laughs> awesome, awesome guy. Where's my pickup? <laughs> Sorry, we're just beating them up. Um, these, these are the people that actually build the tools for you. They're all guitar players. They're all musicians. And um, uh, I don't know. I remember when Jay and I first started doing sessions, Jay Gray and I, we just had like a, like a golf bag full of pedals. Right. I mean, you know, you, you got to bring something with you. And you're right. Don't expect the engineer to get your sound for you. Right. So speaking of Yoshi and uh, tools and tones, we should mention, this is, this is going to be a great segue. Wait till, wait till you get this. Blues Cube amplifiers that both uh, Danny and Jeff are playing through sounded fantastic up here, and I think we should listen to them play some more through those amplifiers. What do you guys think? Yeah. Got Let's another song for us? Uh, you want to do that, uh, the tune Jordan sings for a little, uh, oh, okay. what do you think? It's up to you. Let's do that. Okay. Right, we're going to try. <laughs> try. There's only do. Only do. Unbelievable. Uh, this is a tune that the Doobies covered. Uh, it was originally done by Kim Weston, the motel. And um, all I can tell you is not only is Jordan in the pocket when it comes to playing drums, but she's got a great voice, too. So uh, now that we've built you up, don't get Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> let's not. <laughs> Just say I'm terrible, and then it'll always be good. You don't sound terrible, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Once more, take me in your arms. Rock me, rock me a little while. Come on, baby. Rock me, rock me a little while. Rock me, rock me a little while. We all must be here for eight sometimes. Right now, right now, I'm feeling my high. I've tried my best to be strong. Let's get a 
Great stuff, right? Awesome. So just listening to that song, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot. We have two guitar players here, and you were obviously not playing the same things. But what kind of informed your decisions of what parts each of you would play for a song like that? Well, for me, I mean, I kind of went with the original stuff that I did on the original record. And, sure. you know, Danny and his infinite wisdom and great taste you know, said, okay, well, that's what that is. I'm going to find a spot. I'm going to find a the spot that compliments it. So I, I would say that's, I'm not speaking for you, but. That's exactly right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, so. <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> that's the answer. Like I said, I was the most like ridiculous I said thing I ever heard. <laughs> play, play what the other guy ain't playing, you know? That, that's right. Like I was saying right. earlier. You know? So uh, uh, I mentioned in the beginning you guys were with a, a few bands that people may have, may have heard of, and uh, you guys are both vocalists as well, doing vocal parts. How important in working with a band is being a vocalist along with being a, a musician or a guitar player? Well, obviously, you get more gigs. If you can sing harmony, you, 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 you're, you're going to get hired for more gigs because they won't have to hire someone else to sing. So it, it can help you in that way. And also, singing just helps you f understand what uh, your lead singer is doing. If you're a harmony, you, it, it helps you understand what you should be playing what you shouldn't be playing based on the fact that you're singing yourself. So it opens your eyes, I think, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Well, it's another tool in your toolkit. That's right. I mean, if you got if you got that in your back pocket, plus, I mean, the, the good thing about singing is that everybody has a built-in guitar teacher. That's called your voice. I mean, there's things that you can't play, but you can sing just about everything. So when you sit down in front of the TV, you know, and you got you got a little time on your hands, and just sit down and sing along with what you play. Just even if it's simple. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da
and do that and do that and do that and pretty soon you'll be going blah, da, 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 da. you'll be able to sing but better than that oh yeah absolutely yeah absolutely hey sorry i couldn't resist i'm a triple scale guy in a double scale world man yeah. but it's a built-in guitar teacher if you do that if you learn to track your voice with your fingers, and that's where your brain works, you will be amazed at the things you can do. Actually, what I would, I, would, I would suggest, turn on your little recorder, whatever it is that you record, and start by singing slowly, only sing and play the things that you can do. And keep doing it for six months, and then play back what you did six months before, and it'll blow your mind how much you've learned, how much you've taught yourself. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a good guitar teacher, but you have all this stuff built in, and your voice is the key. The key to that, absolutely. Especially if you got to learn something. What I do in a session sometimes is I will, in my mind, I'll sing what, what's written. I'll sing the melody. And that helps me, number one, get it in my mind, get it down, and also make sure that it, you know, I, what I'm reading is, is correct. Right. Your voice is the key to everything. Right. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And also, uh, when you're going to, to play a solo or working up a solo, you know, if you sing it, it's definitely going to be melodic because you're playing what, you, what you've been singing. So that's a really good way to play a melod beautiful melodic solo is to sing it. Yeah, right. a new concept called melody. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the guys that invented that for guitar were the Ventures. Uh, I'm serious. I don't know if you guys, anybody here ever hear of the Ventures? You know, you know they sold more records than the Beatles. It's an incredible band. And those, ki those guys, what they did is they played melodies. It's yeah, like, sure did, right? wow. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting concept. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So really quickly, before we get too far, um, uh, we are playing out of the uh, Roller Blues Cube Amplifier, which is uh, it's a project that we've been working on for four years, four or five years. Yeah, yeah. It's it's the idea was, uh, you know, Cooch would tell me, you know, I I like this amplifier about this, I, this something I don't like about this, but I like this amplifier something I don't like about that. You know, could we build something at Roland? And I've been with Roland for 43 years more than most of you people have been on the planet, actually. But we, the idea was to build an amplifier that could do just about everything. So, and, you know, nothing is perfect, but the idea, we spent years and years and years, and we spent a lot of time in Hamamatsu, we spent a lot of time in, 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 in L.A. working on this amp, and I gotta tell you, um, I called Kucha, you know, said, yeah, you gotta try this amp. He goes, ah, man, you know, I, I, I got my, I says, Kuch, let me give you one. And so I gave it to him, and he's, First, he calls me back and says, I gotta make a goddamn thing work. I said, hold on. Because, <laughs> you know, it takes a little while to get used to it. And then, uh, then he called me back about three weeks later. He goes, oh my God, it's amplifier. It's awesome. It does everything. I'm not, you know, well, you can. No, you, he's exactly right. This is like the Swiss Army knife of amps because you can, you can tune it to whatever room you're in. Uh, for instance, if you're in a smaller club and you want to tune it down, you can do that by adjusting the, watt, the output on it. And then there's. Um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, obviously the master volumes and stuff. So there's a lot you can do with this thing. And, uh, it, and generally it just sounds great. You know, but when I heard Skunk had designed it, I said, well, I got to have one. Because well, no, I didn't design it. I was part of the design. Uh, I mean, you got Yoshi and the boys over at Hamamatsu, too. You got to give them credit. Brilliant ears. You know, brilliant ears. So and we have this thing called a tone capsule, which is if you don't like what you, you know, you don't exactly like what the app is and when you buy it, you can buy these tone capsules, Robin Ford, Eric Johnson and myself, that we've basically gone in into the guts of the amplifier and redesign and re, um, I guess redesign would be the word, uh, customize it to the sounds that we like. I mean, and the, the guys are rolling, they're, they're completely nuts about this stuff. I mean, they're, they're talking about how do I get the, the time that passes inside the liquid of a capacitor for four years as opposed to six years. I mean, they're really nuts about this stuff, but they did it. And so you can, you can go after this. I mean, I designed my tone capsule because I'm a pedal steel player as well, and I wanted absolute clarity. I wanted, you know, pre-delay, which Yoshi's one of the few people on the planet gets that uh, in terms of reverb. I wanted it to be sparkle clean, right? We used to have an, we had an argument about that. I said, I don't want to call it sparkle clean because it sounds like a laundry detergent. But, <laughs> hey, he's, he was right. People like it. But the idea is that you can, you can customize this amplifier any way you want, or you can talk to your favorite artist. We're going to get Cooch involved. Um, I mean, he likes the basic thing, but, you know, we'll, we'll bug him. We'll get him involved to make his own tone capsule. But uh, does anybody out here have a Blues Cube artist? 
Well, we need more. Get one. They're yeah, fantastic. Get one. Yeah. yeah, or at least go over to the roller booth and try it out. I mean, that's, you know, that's all. You, we got a couple here, right? Yeah. yeah, just go out there and try it out. It'll blow your mind. Anyway, <laughs> that's the rolling bath. And we do know a place you can buy one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> talk to Cooch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's the new rolling dealer in Beverly Hills, right? There you go. There you go. So I think we should hear the amps again. You guys want to play another song? Yeah. Right on. <laughs> Um, yeah, good. Turn me back up. Beautiful. So here's a tune that um, close enough. Um, this is a, a, a tune I wrote for Don Henley years ago uh, for his second uh, solo album. And when we did it, uh, the whole thing was synthesizers. So now we trans made it into a guitar, a guitar rock and roll tune. I played for you. All she wants to do is dance. And put them in a pen All she wants to do is dance, dance The rebel's been rebelling But since I don't know when All she wants to do is dance A Molotov cocktail is the local drink All she wants to do is dance, dance They mix them right up in the kitchen sink all she wants to do is dance There's crazy people walking around With blood in their eyes All she wants to do is dance, dance Wild eyed pistol weavers that are not afraid to die All she wants to do All she wants to do is dance And make romance She can't feel the heat Coming off the street, boy She wants to party to get down yeah. All she wants to do All she wants to do Is dance Well the government Fucked the men's room At the local disco now All she wants to do is dance Keep the boys from selling all the weapons sacred ground. All she wants to do is dance. Well, that don't keep the government from making our bunk or two. All she wants to do is dance, dance. That stupid selling US all the drugs that we can't do. All she wants to do, all she wants to do is dance and make romance. But you can't feel the heat. Coming off the street, boy She wants a party Ooh. She wants to get down hey. All she wants to do All she wants to do Is dance Shout. They said, don't come back here, Yankee, but if I ever do, 
I'll bring more money Cause all she wants to do is dance And make romance She can't feel the heat Coming off the street, boy She wants a party She wants to get down, yeah All she wants to do All she wants to do is dance she wants to do is dance All she wants to sensitive <laughs> so so we only have a few minutes left and I, I have two questions that I'd, I'd like to ask you guys before we wrap up here since we just saw such great examples from both of you talk a little bit about each of you if you would about your approach to soloing are you thinking chords are you thinking scales are you, I mean we're, we're all guitar geeks here right and so uh, so tell us a little bit about how you approach that Go ahead, Jeff. you start <laughs> well for me if, if you're if you're at a loss for something there's two places to go one is the melody of the song. I mean, a lot of good solos just follow the melody of the song. And then if that doesn't work and you're stuck, boy, I don't know, maybe, maybe life is different. When I was a kid, we had nursery rhymes. We had these little songs that we learned as kids, you know. I wrote that. Gives you some, it gives you a place to go, it gives you a place to grab. And then uh, if you really like nuts, when I was in the doobies, I used to wear headphones on stage because to me, it's all a big studio. You know, depending on how many people, 50,000, two guys, it doesn't make a difference. Give me a good mix, a place to sit, a comfortable chair, and I'm good to go. So the guys would, <laughs> it, the headphones, besides porno movies and basketball scores, it would try to drive me crazy. They would, they, my guitar tech would come out and 30 seconds before a solo would come out with a piece of paper and we'd write like um, uh, 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 Handel's Joie de, de Vivre or some piece of music that I had to somehow Im incorporate into the solo of the, of the particular tune. I had 30 seconds, you know, to do it. So, uh, uh, you know. <laughs> Made a great solo for uh, China Grove, uh, 
But and then they would, then it would get really weird. You know, these are a few of my favorite things in like keeps you running and all this kind of stuff. But the idea was that uh, go. There's no place you can't go. Right. There is no place you can't go. But again, start with a vocal. Start with a nursery rhyme. Pick one of your favorite songs and just do it. I mean, that's one of the thing about great jazz players. They'll be bopping away and be going, where the hell I go? And all of a sudden, you'll hear like a melody that's familiar. They'll bring you back in and then go out. Right. Well, what I would say is start with a note. Find one note and start with a note. It's always best to start a solo with a note, <laughs> in, in my experience. So you go. And then you follow it by another note. But if you just start with a note, find a place, and then continue over there. But you got to start someplace. I always go to the blues, you know, because that's how I came up playing. So whatever I do, it's based on the blues. But if you're playing a tune that's very major, then you got to stay away from those blue notes and find a different way to do it. If you're an E, instead of playing, you play. Okay. See, that's major. So. Those just no By the way, this is the drummer for the Stray Cats. Say hi. Yeah! Say hi, Jim. <laughs> so anyway, I got to go. <laughs> I'll, be back. I'll be right back. I'll call you back. <laughs> hey, you know, it's, it's the way things work. These I don't days. think we can follow that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one, one, one story. I got on stage once in Japan with Yngwie Milstein, you know. Oy vey wingnut. I mean, listen. <laughs> that guy is such a virtuoso guitar player. It's frightening. It's like Paganini, you know. So what are you going to do? What are you going to, how are you going to follow, uh, you know, playing with, uh, with, you know, after he plays like some unbelievable solo? With one note. <laughs> <laughs> and I just kept holding it. <laughs> and the audience is going, okay, and it just kept holding. <laughs> then you hold it some more. <laughs> then you hold it a little more. And then people start, yeah, all right. <laughs> and you keep holding it, they go, yeah, and finally they're going, yeah, wah! you know? It's, you're absolutely right, you start with one note. <laughs> That's awesome. So my last question for you before we, uh, before we let you guys go, I know you gotta catch a plane, but um, you've both worked with so many amazing artists through the years. What is it, in your opinion, that makes a great artist? Oh, that's easy, heart and soul. It's the same thing. You, you know, that, that's what it takes to be a good musician, good pro, any, it's all about heart and soul. You know, you've got to mean it. It's gotta come from deep down inside. You don't write from your brain and go, oh, this is clever, this is good. It comes from your soul. You've got to mean it. And that's what makes a great uh, uh, artist, you know. And uh, Skunk and I both work with many really great artists. As a matter of fact, all of them, I think, <laughs> at this point, between the two of us. And they all have that. They all really mean it. They all dig deep and find something that's meaningful that's going to get uh, people going, going to make them, you know, the idea of music to me is to remind you of your own humanity, to remind you that you're human and that you're connected with all the other with everybody else, all, the, all other humanity. And I think that's what really great music does and certainly what a great artist uh, aims to do. Awesome, anything to add? No, uh, not, uh, you're absolutely right. And the, the trick is, if there is such a thing, it's open to the kimono. I mean, if you're not, if your soul isn't completely naked and barred in front of everyone, then you're not doing your job. Because if you hold back, everybody will know it. I mean, if, if, you, if you really want to show what you have. And frankly, uh, there's a psychological term called flow, where if you can get to the point where you can remove the conscious part of your brain and just connect from wherever it is in that inner piece that you have to your fingers or your voice or whatever it is, uh, then you have found at least the key. Because um, all, I, I don't know about you, Cooch, you, I, I, I'm not gonna speak for you, but when I play a really, what I, think or other people think is a really great guitar solo, I don't remember. Yeah, I know, right? If you're at the, in the moment right. and you just let that flow and you get rid of that spot, then yet you are opening your soul and you're opening yourself. And that's, I think, the, 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 the key to being a true artist. Yeah, I think so too. Awesome. Well, another great segue here. We've been privileged to have two great artists here in front of us today. Would you please thank them for coming in here? We appreciate you guys. So we're gonna, these guys are gonna jump off stage here and uh, if you wanna talk to them for a second, they're gonna come out.